Hi everyone, welcome to the Social House and Technical Update for March 2020 presented by BDO. My name is Hamid Gafour and I lead the not-for-profit team across the North of England for, uh, for BDO. In terms of the presentation today, together with me today are Helen Knowles. Um, Helen uh, is an audit director in my team and, and Andy Holt, who's a senior audit manager in the team. In terms of the presentation, what we're going to talk through are, is to provide you with a technical update on the latest trends in audit and accounting, uh, which will hopefully provide you support as you come up to that audit season, uh, which is now fast coming up upon us. And also, um, I will then provide a hot topic sector update on what we're seeing as a firm across uh, the sector in terms of hot topics and issues that are impacting on our clients. So without further ado, I'll pass it across to Helen Knowles, who will talk through some of these issues around audit preparation and audit focus. I'm going to start off by covering narrative reporting. Narrative reporting is an increasing area of focus for both financial reporting and housing regulators. By narrative reporting, I'm mainly talking about the front end of your financial statement, but it does capture some narrative disclosures as well. Firstly, some general tips for you to think about. The annual report should tell a story from beginning to end and also be forward looking. It should be fair, balanced and understandable. We're finding that clients are adding more and more information to the front end each year and as a result it's becoming longer and doesn't flow well. And some organisations are using it as a marketing document. I'd encourage you to stand back and consider what's needed and what isn't and what could be included elsewhere. And given the focus on this area, I do recommend that you don't leave it till the end of the audit process. Start early and engage your audit committee and board. And just a note, as auditors, we've now got responsibilities for reaching conclusions on your narrative reports, so we'll need to see supporting evidence for any information you include. I recommend that you compile this as you go along and include cross-references from your narrative report. Moving on to large company narrative reporting. For periods beginning on or after the 1st of January 2019, there are a number of new narrative reporting requirements for large and medium companies. Some of the requirements are applicable to subsidiaries in their individual accounts. And just a note, cooperative and community benefit societies are not captured by these new requirements. However, they do represent the general direction of travel for narrative reporting and are therefore considered best practice. So it may be something you want to consider going forwards. So taking you through each of the new requirements in turn. Firstly, the section 172 statement. This is a new rule applying to all large companies, including large subsidiaries in their individual accounts. And as a reminder, the Companies Act defines a large company as one which meets two or more of the following qualifying conditions. So where turnover is 36 million or more, where the balance sheet total is 18 million or more, and where the average number of employees is 250 or more. This requirement requires inclusion of a separate statement in the strategic report and on the company's website that describes how the directors have had regard to their duties as set out in section 172 of the Companies Act. Under section 172, directors have a duty to promote the success of the company. The section includes six areas that directors should have regard to. The statement must make reference to key decisions and strategies that have affected the financial year. The FRC has recently issued a revised version of its guidance on the strategic report, which includes a section dealing with this new disclosure requirement, as well as guidance on the non-financial reporting requirements that applied to public interest entities with more than 500 employees from 2017. The second new requirement is engagement with employees. Large and medium-sized companies with more than 250 UK-based employees must include in their director's report a summary of how the directors have engaged with employees and how they have had regard to employee interests. The statement must include reference to the principal decisions taken during the year as well as references to the general process and procedure. The third new requirement is engagement with suppliers, customers and others. 
Again, this applies to companies that exceed the qualifying conditions that I referenced earlier. And they must include in their director's report a statement summarising how the directors have had regard to the need to foster business relationships with the company's suppliers, customers and others. Again, they must include reference to the principal decisions taken during the year, as well as references to the general process and procedure. The final new requirement is a statement of corporate governance arrangements. This applies to all large companies and they must include in their director's report and on the website a statement of corporate governance arrangements. The statement should provide information on the company's compliance with the corporate governance code or explain the reasons for not adopting a corporate governance code together with what arrangements for corporate governance were in place for that year. To assist with this requirement, the FRC has published the Weights Corporate Governance Principles for large private companies. This is a voluntary code that is intended to be the key code for companies within the scope of these large company corporate governance requirements. The Weights Code has been drafted on an apply and explain basis, meaning that companies adopting it must seek to apply all six of the high-level principles and explain in their corporate governance statements how they have done so. Moving on to environmental reporting. For periods beginning on or after the 1st of April 2019, many large companies and LLPs will need to provide new or enhanced disclosures on greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. Quoted companies have been subject to mandatory director's report greenhouse gas emissions disclosure requirements since 2013. These new rules add to and amend those requirements. All unquoted companies that meet the definition of a large company, as assessed by reference to the qualifying conditions in the Companies Act, so turnover of 36 million or more, balance sheet total of 18 million or more, and average number of employees of 250 or more, will be required to include new greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption disclosures in their director's reports. Subsidiary companies are exempt if consolidated and group disclosures are given. Cooperative and community benefit societies again are not captured by these new reporting requirements. However, again, they do represent the direction of travel and are therefore considered best practice. So it may be something you want to consider going forward for these entities. So, companies that consume more than 40,000 kilowatts of energy annually must... Firstly, disclose the annual quantity of emissions and the annual quantity of energy consumed. They must describe the calculation methods used and any energy efficiency improvement measures. They must present at least one ratio that expresses the company's annual emissions in relation to a quantifiable factor associated with its activities. Comparatives must be provided after the first year of application. And finally, just to note, companies consuming less than 40,000 kilowatts of energy need only state that fact. The final area that I wanted to cover under preparation of the financial statements is the new accounting direction 2019. This is effective for periods commencing the 1st of April 2019. And actually, it's not the major overhaul expected by some. It's largely a tidying up of the 2015 direction. I'll briefly talk you through some of the key changes. So firstly, particulars of turnover, cost of sales, operating expenditure and operating surplus. Clarification has been provided on the detailed income and expenditure notes to make sure they're consistent with the statement of comprehensive income. For example, the disclosure of profits or losses on the sale of property, plant and equipment and decisions to include or exclude in operating activities. Costs should be allocated to the main headings as far as possible, or additional lines added for material areas of expenditure. And just to note, those groups with listed debt who are therefore required to produce an operating segment report still need to include this analysis. Secondly, the analysis of intra-group transactions. The analysis of transactions between private registered providers and unregistered group members has been expanded. And as a reminder, previously the notes to the accounts needed to describe 
Firstly, the basis of any significant apportionment, recharge or allocation of turnover, costs, assets and liabilities between the private registered provider and the other party. And it also needed to specify in aggregate the turnover, costs, assets or liabilities which have been apportioned or allocated and also specify the group members involved in the apportionment or allocation. The private registered provider must now also set out any cross guarantees, debts between group entities or financial support made across group members. The value for money narrative should give stakeholders information on firstly performance against the private registered provider's own value for money targets, secondly performance against any metrics set out by the regulator and thirdly how the performance compares to peers. Information on measurable plans to address any areas of underperformance should be included, with any areas where improvements would not be appropriate clearly identified together with the rationale for this. The need to signpost stakeholders to other more detailed value for money statements held outside the narrative report have now been removed. In terms of compliance with the Governance and Financial Viability Standard, these requirements have now been updated. The statement on compliance should specifically cover compliance with the standard during the course of the year and up to the signing of the accounts. Any non-compliance since the previous report should be explained. And the final change that I wanted to flag to you is around unit number disclosures. And now a reconciliation of the units held at the start and end of the accounting reporting period should be provided for each category of property. Moving on to going concern, which will continue to be a key issue for audits. Last autumn, the FRC issued a revised going concern standard in response to recent well-publicised corporate failures. The revised standard, ICA UK 570 going concern, follows concerns about the quality and rigour of audit and increases the work auditors are required to do when assessing whether an entity is a going concern. It means UK auditors will follow significantly stronger requirements than those required by current international standards. The revised standard requires greater work on the part of the auditor to more robustly challenge management's assessment of going concern and thoroughly testing the adequacy of the supporting evidence. The new standard is effective and mandatory for audits of financial statements for periods commencing on or after the 15th of December 2019. However, BDO has decided to adopt the principles of the new standard early for our audits of March 2020 accounts. So what does this mean for you as housing organisations? Well, it continues to very much be your responsibility to ensure the going concern status of your organisation. We will require management to prepare a going concern summary at the planning stage of the audit as well as the completion stage for our assessment and challenge. That going concern assessment will need to be at an entity level, so not just at that group level. So for every company we sign an audit report for, we will need a separate going concern assessment. When doing that assessment, you should not only be considering the financial and cash flow forecasts, but also wider issues as well, such as coronavirus, Brexit, the regulatory environment, or loss of a key supplier or customer. You should also be reviewing the going concern disclosures in your accounts to make sure that they clearly reflect the going concern position of that particular company. And just a final point to note, In a lot of instances, there's been a long-standing reliance on a letter of support, for example, from another group company, from a bank, from somebody providing cash or not calling on debt. We as auditors now need to be much more challenging about these letters as a source of audit evidence, particularly in the current environment. So often when you look behind these letters, will that third party actually provide the funding? Are they in a position to be able to do so? So we'll now be looking more towards legally binding sources of support or funding as audit evidence, so requiring that parent or investor to pledge on a legally binding basis. So if the going concern status depends on a letter of support from a third party, please do have those discussions early with us.
Finally, I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about future accounting changes. Recent changes to international accounting standards have had a big impact on how companies account for revenue, leases and financial instruments. The FRC have indicated that they intend to incorporate these requirements into UK accounting standards in due course. Our current expectations is that these will affect social housing accounts for the first time in 2023, with comparative figures being presented in line with the new standards. I'll very briefly summarise now the key impacts of the big three accounting standards. So firstly, IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. And it's those with long-term and more complex contracts that will be most effective as there may be changes to the timing and amount of revenue recognised. However, this will be dependent on the specific terms of the contract, how the entity previously accounted for the contract, and if the contract contains any features which were not covered in the existing guidance. Depending on these factors, the standard may result in significant changes to an entity's revenue profile. IFRS 9, Financial Instruments, introduces new requirements that will affect most entities, although the most significant effect will be on those with large loan portfolios. For most registered providers, the new expected loss impairment model will require extensive changes to systems and processes, with provisions for rent arrears being greater in size and recognised earlier than currently under FRS 102. There will be similar effects for intercompany loans and related party debt. Whilst there are simplified rules for trade receivables, substantial work is still likely to be required. The new model is not equivalent to a general provisions model. And finally, IFRS 16, leases. Under this standard, all operating leases will need to be brought onto the balance sheet, showing a tangible fixed asset and a liability for the discounted amount of future payments. Costs will then be recognised each year to reflect the amortisation of the tangible fixed asset, as well as the finance cost on the unwinding of the discounting of future payments. This will result in a front-loaded expense profile compared to the straight-line expense profile that is currently applied to operating leases. And we'll provide further updates on all of these topics as the FRSC consider how to integrate the international standards with existing UK standards. In the meantime, I'd very much encourage you to make sure that your boards are made aware of the potential impact of these standards, particularly if you're considering entering into new banking arrangements which contain covenants. The FRS 102 Triennial Review didn't really introduce any any major, major changes. It was more more tidy-up exercise more than anything. Um, it's effective for periods beginning on or after 1st of January 2019, so it's it comes into play for year-ended 31st March 2020. Um, just running through some of the areas that it impacts on social housing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's reintroduced the old UK gap option of treating intergroup investment properties at uh, historic cost accounting rather than treating them as investment properties and having to value them, carry them at fair value in the entity books, but then reverse that and treat them at historic cost in the group accounts. Um, that is an accounting policy choice though, so you can continue with the previous treatment if you prefer. It's introduced some clarifications as to what is part of operating profit and needs to be shown above that operating profit line. More on that a little later. Um, clarified the gift aid treatment where you're paying gift aid from subsidiary to parent undertaking. Uh, where that is taking place, there needs to be that legal commitment as at year-end date. Um, so either you've physically paid it or there's some sort of legal deed, a board minute isn't sufficient to be able to recognise that gift aid payment in that financial year. Um, the tax treatment's unchanged, so you still have that, that period post year end where you can still make the payment and treat it for tax purposes as if it was in that financial year. Um, some of the financial instrument 
um, classification wording has been tidied up a little. Uh, it means a small number of um, financial instruments which were treated as other or non-basic can now move into the more straightforward amortised cost treatment that we have in uh, for basic financial instruments. It's also cleared up, cleared up the, the issue around negative compensation clauses which caused several issues the first year FRS 102 came in. So any of your loans with negative compensation clauses, you can continue to treat those at basic costs, and that's supported now by the wording in FRS 102. Um, some of the financial instrument definition wording has been um, clarified further. This means that some of your special purpose vehicles, which were were there just to, to either draw down listed debt or, or to hold debt, um, the wording's been clarified so that, that they hopefully won't fall into the definition of financial instruments and it, and it should reduce disclosures for those entities that were caught by that requirement. And finally, um, it's introduced, reintroduced the net debt reconciliation as part of your cash flow statement. So it's just further detail on the cash flow statement. The updated housing SORP uh, of 2018 um, has, has been again updated to reflect the changes coming from the FRS 102 training or review. Uh, so again, it's effective for year ended 31st March 2020. Not a great deal of showstoppers here, as as reflected, there aren't that many changes in FRS 102. Um, just a bit more detail here on the clarification around what needs to be treated as operating profit um so it's it, it's now outlined that items must not be excluded from operating profit if they clearly relate to operations and, it, and it's added examples there so things like write downs profit on loss of sale of property plant and equipment investment property and intangibles so when you're selling your fixed asset housing properties um it will be part of operating profit um i think most of my clients have certainly been doing that but i know one or two who haven't um that's now a requirement um of the uh, of the sorp and frs 102 items such as restructuring and relocation costs again they're operating and it and it it mustn't exclude items just because they don't occur regularly. Uh, it mustn't exclude items just because they don't involve cash flows. So items such as depreciation and amortization. I, again, all my clients were treating those as part of operating profit anyway. But um, yeah, that's been tidied up by the uh, by the SOAP update. We've been getting asked a lot of questions around cladding replacement and fire risk assessment related expenditure um probably well obviously since uh, the grenfell disaster happened a couple of years ago um but it is sort of coming to a head now as there is more government pressure there are legal changes happening as we speak and 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 that's a moving feast in terms of the legal changes uh, and, and we're getting asked questions about what does that mean in terms of now there's a legal requirement to, uh, say, remove a certain type of cladding or install certain uh, types of fire doors. What does that mean in terms of the expenditure? What does it mean in terms of impairment? When do we reflect the expenditure in terms of timing? What about other types of expenditure, type such as sprinklers, fire doors? Is it... Um, an issue if we're replacing uh, certain types of components or versus new expenditure on on buildings that didn't pre previously have that type of thing. So, firstly, in terms of the legal requirement, uh, we, we've been asked a few times: Does it mean if we've got a legal requirement as at our reporting date to remove? Um, cladding, replace cladding, that we should recognise the cost as at that point in time. Um, provided you haven't yet sort of entered into the contracts for that work to be done, 
our view is that you wouldn't recognise the cost at at the reporting date um, just because the legal requirement is in place. The reason for that being there would be an alternative course of action albeit not necessarily a realistic one. So you may be able to um, dispose of the property, you may be able to demolish the property. That There would be other options that are available to you, so you wouldn't recognise the cost until you've entered into into that contract where, where, where you've actually committed to it. In terms of uh, the legal changes and that being an impairment trigger, where you have properties that are impacted by any legal changes, which may, means you have to do work to the property, uh, we would consider that to be an impairment trigger and you would need to do an impairment review for that property. The main question we get asked around this type of expenditure is, should it be treated as capital? Should it be treated as revenue expenditure? And there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all answer here and you will need to consider your individual circumstances. Um, if we've got cladding expenditure, for example, where you have cladding as one of your fixed asset housing property components, um, that's just a component replacement. So you would dispose of the old cladding component and capitalise the new cladding component as, as a normal component replacement. Where you do, uh, where you don't have a of the particular type of expenditure as a current component to the property, um, you would need to consider whether, in order to capitalise, it needs to be an enhancement to the property. So the criteria for an enhancement to the property under FRS 102 or an enhancement to an asset under FRS 102, um, it's either increasing future income streams. So for a property, does it increase its saleability in the future does it mean you can charge more rent that's often a difficult stumbling block in social housing does it reduce your future costs and can you demonstrate that it reduces your future costs does it extend the life of the asset and again can you demonstrate that it extends the life of the asset um, if you are looking to capitalize um, such expenditure we would expect our clients to be producing a paper along these lines that that's outlining what those enhancements are to that particular of that particular expenditure you'd also maybe need to consider what what you're actually spending so are, are, you, are you replacing like for like or are you enhancing what was there previously so kind of an all singing all dancing for example sprinkler system or are you just making good what was there previously if you're just making good it's hard to argue that it's an enhancement it feels just like a, a repair or a replacement um probably a stronger argument for capitalizing where you where you're going above and beyond the the requirement i think we probably expect to see some sort of i e impact where you are making this type of expenditure whether that be that you are capitalizing say um, fire doors, you must be replacing something so that so there'd be a requirement to write out of your fixed assets whatever cost you had of fire doors previously. Um, if you aren't able to, to identify that expenditure, you're probably in an area where you're looking at, again, an impairment trigger. And, and I, again, I, I, are you having an element of impairment where you, you've spent money on the property that you perhaps can't get back? As I said, this is an area that uh, is a bit of a moving feast in terms of the legal requirements around fire doors, um, cladding certainly. So it is kind of watch this space and make sure you, you're taking all of your individual areas of expenditure, considering them carefully and making sure that you properly document and confirm the treatment with your auditors. Finally, for me, I'm just going to talk around pensions Um a brief summary of uh, some of the issues and challenges we're seeing in this area. As we state on the slide, uh, this is an area of increasing uh, management and auditor challenge of the assumptions. This is coming from our regulator, and, and we know we've had, we've seen actuaries confirm that they're seeing increasing challenge from auditors. Um, I, I suppose the point there is that it sh should be management should be challenging. Um, their actuaries in, the, in in a similar way that the auditors are. You need to be comfortable that your figures are correct. 
that those assumptions are correct for your business um rather than just taking the the standard assumptions have you made a consideration of whether they actually fit your circumstances again good practice here is to have a short a short paper whether that's a board paper or just an internal um accounting paper considering what the actuary has told you and whether you and and what your decisions are going to be in terms of assumptions pension assets is an interesting area um where we've got these multi-employer large local government schemes which we see quite a lot um in the social housing world um it's always been a challenge to confirm that the asset position is correct as at 31st march of each financial year one of the challenges is around timing so uh in order to get the the accounting numbers for your pension scheme uh, in a reasonable time scale quite often the actuaries will take 31st december actual asset figures and then make a, a number of assumptions and roll those figures forward to 31st of march in each financial year um the challenge there for 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 management and for auditors is how do you know those asset figures are correct as at 31st march um and that is a question if you are going for the earlier figures and and not waiting until say late may to get the actual march asset position um how do you know those assets are correct especially with the volatility in world equities at the moment given the coronavirus outbreak so those are the types of discussions you should be having with the actuaries are they able to if you are going for the earlier figures are they able to give you some sort of confirmation that the asset position is materially correct as at 31st march what are the cost implications of that um those sorts of questions in terms of mcleod that was a a, bit, a big issue last year quite late in the day as well uh, in terms of it was it was an age discrimination type judgment that it it, it was it was clear that there was a, an additional liability there um all the actuaries assumptions papers that we're seeing are including mcleod as a full liability or including the full impact of mcleod this year so you should see that reflected in your numbers um guaranteed minimum pension equalization which is a similar type judgment though it's on the basis of um gender discrimination um this is an area we are seeing some inconsistency between different actuaries some actuaries are saying that that case has been decided and we need to reflect the impact of that in full some actuaries are saying um the government are still defending their position on this and we don't think there is an additional liability to reflect clearly there's some inconsistency there um I, I suppose the bigger issue is if you've got multiple local government schemes and one is arguing that it shouldn't be included and one is arguing that it should be included um you need to be speaking to the actuaries um trying to make adopt a consistent approach i think bdo's view is most are saying gmp equalization is something that needs to be reflected uh, and that would be the route i would go down but the the minimum you need to do is understand what the the magnitude of the impact is so that should be the sort of question you'd be asking your actuaries finally uh social housing pension schemes obviously the changes came in last year and that was reflected in in the normal way a defined benefit scheme is accounted for that continues into this year um just to flag on social housing pension scheme we are seeing quite a lot of bulk transfers out of ships um where basically they're taking their chunk of assets and liabilities and moving them into a, a separate fund that they manage themselves um the accounting for that shouldn't be too difficult uh, where where our clients have gone down the social housing pension scheme route um it is just something to be aware of that it will will cause some changes and we and, and you need to be on top of the timing of requests and things like that okay so back to me now and i'm going to talk about the wider environment and some of the things that we're seeing impacting on the clients that we work with in the registered provider sector so what i'm going to focus on is just a wider sector insight some some of those those from a higher level some of those themes coming through um I think it's quite useful actually also to talk through some of the changes that we're seeing impacting on the, on the audit market and some of the changes in order that will probably flow through in the next next few years um 
then a bit of a regulatory insight in terms of what we're seeing from the regulator and their focus. Um, we have a number of clients who have recently been through IDAs and it's quite interesting to see some of the themes that are coming through and the change in focus from the regulator. And then finally, a top level um, review of the barometer findings that we did. This is BDO's own survey um, that we do in terms of what are the key risks impacting on the sector and what we saw coming out from that, which um, I don't think would be any great surprise to anyone, but certainly something that should be focused on. So in terms of that wider sector insight and what we're seeing happening across our client base and the clients we work with, I will, you know, mainly a focus on the north because that's where we we work from from the uh, the office here the offices here um development still a big part of plans for organizations significant programs um a- across the north i suppose the challenge with this really is that our organizations um in terms of the, the level of resource required both from a land perspective and a people perspective are they are they able to deal with that have they got the right plans in place to be able to address any issues around shortfalls around around those areas uh, but but certainly significant development pr- programs across the majority of our rps and then expansion of that and that is starting to flow through in terms of numbers um across across our, the client base that we've got um Whole health and safety, massive focus from the regulator, and, and, and certainly we're seeing our clients um, having a real focus on this in terms of looking at how they approach health and safety and that whole piece around the one version of, of, of the truth in terms of ensuring that the data they have is consistent, is accurate, and there's no issues coming from that in terms of potential issues around poor data quality, which can then also have wider issues for organisations um, if they have got that poor data quality and they are then impacted by uh, a, from a legal perspective, for example, around gas safety, etc. Um, the environmental impact um, is, 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 is you know, from a wider perspective, you can see that, you know, in terms of the last 12 months in the news, it's a, it's a big topic for, 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 for people, for individuals, for organisations. I think what we're seeing is organisations looking at this, not just from a, a building properties perspective, but a wider organisational perspective in terms of the impact that that organisation has on the wider environment that they work in, the communities that they work in, and making assessments around that, starting to make assessments around that. And that is something that's only going to develop and evolve as we, as we move forward. Um, diversity in terms of staff and, and board, still a key area of focus for organisations. Um, organisations want to ensure that they are not restricting themselves in terms of uh, the, the staff, in terms of ensuring that the policies and pro- processes they have in place are able to bring in the, the right people um, and there's no restrictions ar- around that. And from a board perspective, ensuring they have that right mix in terms from a skills perspective uh, and also from a, a gender and, and a BAME and a wider perspective around, around diversity to ensure that you are able to get all those different views, um, which, get, which, is, which is what the richness of diversity is. Um, and certainly that's, we've seen that as an area of focus for, for organisations. Cybercrime. Um, and and cy- the focus on cyber, a big big issue. Uh, we're su- we're certainly seeing a a, a, a real uh, focus um, by criminals in terms of focusing on an organisation such as registered providers um, a- around this. The, f- the phishing emails, the change of bank detail emails, um, are still coming through. And frankly, uh, we are seeing a number of instances with those things. That's the, those uh, attempted frauds are still are still working. Um, the, the example I've put on the, on the slide is, is Red Kite, uh, which is a southern based um, RP um, who were hit by a, a change in contractor details um, fraud and lost almost a, a, a million pounds. Um, the wider impact of that is around the regulatory bit where they were downgraded off the back of that as well. So the impact of one of these frauds hitting your organisation is significant from a reputational perspective, the bad press, but also from a, a governance perspective and a regulatory perspective. And it's something that organisations need to continually need to be assessing um, around the controls and processes they have and reminding their staff that they are uh, following those controls and processes because where this goes wrong is where shortcuts are taken around those controls and processes. And finally, a bit of an unknown with, with obviously the new the new government coming in, um, and and effectively, again the sector challenged by the fact that 
uh, potentially there could be further changes in policy from from the government. Um, again, there's a new, another new housing minister who's who's come in as as well. Um, so potentially some impact of, of of that as well. So, just in terms of that, what we're seeing in terms of regulatory focus, and this is really from the the the, the regulator, uh, particularly from what we're hearing from the regulator, but also in terms of the, the client base that we have, we see a number of IDAs and what the focus is around those. Um, a focus from the regulator around stock condition surveys, I think this is something that's stemmed from the back of the uh, the fact that the, the regulator is concerned about the level of, of spend on existing properties and uh, in terms of the capital and, and, and repairs and that, and that organisations have got the right level of spend in their business plans moving forward. Um, and certainly that's something that's an area of focus and, organ and I know a number of organisations that we're working in, working with are looking at the, the processes they have around this uh, and the policies and processes move, moving forward. As ever, business plans and stress testing is, is a continual focus. That whole piece around your organisation having enough cash flow as you move forward, you're bringing the right cash in at the right time in terms of your treasury management policy around this, and that your stress testing that you do is linked back to your 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 risk maps, your ri the, the, the key risks within your organisation, and also your assets and liability register. And that golden thread is a key element of a, fo a focus for the regulator when they are doing IDAs. Clearly data quality and some of the issues organisations have had around data quality, uh, particularly as mentioned before around health and safety, but this is from a wider perspective that organisations in terms of you want to make the right decisions then it's not so much about your systems, it's about actually the quality of your data and ensuring that you have processes in place that have checks on that quality and data and again flowing back to that one version of the truth. Risk flows, um, this is particularly around where organisations have um, group structures and the, 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 um, around those group structures in terms of order committee, in terms of board, who's responsible for what around risk, how do those risks flow through and, and flow through in terms of those organisations, and does the organisation have a full understanding of that so that there's no gaps around that risk aspect. Um, that means that significant risks in one part of the business are not being uh, reported through to other parts of the business. A big focus on the regulator around this, around the understanding that boards have around this and the understanding that senior management have around this and certainly we've seen an area of focus around this in a number of recent IDAs. And that really flows through into the, the structure of organisations as well, um, which is about the organisation structure to have, who's responsible for what in those organisations, what committees are responsible in terms of the order committees and, and wider committees, what responsibilities they have as opposed to individual boards within those organisations and, and, does, and, and are the organisations structured in the most efficient and effective way to provide the right level of service to the communities to, to that, that they serve and certainly again a focus from the regulator uh, around that. And finally the one, the one there is rents, um, always an area of focus and because obviously in terms of the impact that you have with your, with your tenants and, and, and the touch points you have with your tenants around, around rents, um, ensuring that the rent policy you have and the processes you have are in line with the regulatory requirements and especially with the changes that have come through, uh, are coming through around rents over the next 12 months. Um, certainly in terms of the work that we've done recently around rents, um, in terms of internal audits, uh, we found effectively, I think in every internal audit that we've done, we've found issues around calculation of rents and this is particularly around where you have uh, niche properties in, within, your, within your profile and, they, uh, and those niche properties are not following the right regulatory framework um, with regard to rents. So an area of focus and something that you need to be aware of. I think what I wanted to touch upon is probably a, a wider point is, is actually the, the, the audit market in, in itself and audit, um, external audit in itself and effectively uh, what we're seeing is that um, and I'm sure from a wider perspective you're more than aware of some of the issues that happened at Carillion, at BHS, Patricia Valerie, uh, Thomas Cook, all issues where organisations have found themselves in financial difficulty, effectively so some of these organisations have actually have gone bust. Um, and, um, and what comes back then is a focus on the, the directors within that organisation, but also what were external audit doing 
in those organisations because in a number of those cases, external audit uh, at, at a time relatively recent to the time that the organisation went bust, they actually did um, provide clean audit r reports. Um, what we've seen actually off the back of that are a number of reports that have come out um, uh, around audit um, uh, over the, the last um, 18 months or so. The audit profession has been subject to four independent reviews um, which have resulted in more than 550 pages of, of, of recommendations of off-market reform. And some of that market reform is pretty, pretty radical. Um, there's a real focus on the sco scope of the, of the audit um, and effectively what that's looking at is the expectation gap in terms of audit between um, a stakeholder and what the auditors are actually doing when they're following their, their, their auditing standards. And, and effectively what some of these reviews are coming back with is actually guidance which says that that scope, that expectation gap needs to close, which effectively means that external auditors will need to do more work in the future to ensure that that, that focus does, does, does close. And there's also a significant focus on, on, on quality um, and that focus really comes uh, from an, an, from the auditor perspective. Um, effectively, one of the recommendations that we've seen in, in, in the in the Bryden report is around uh, a new profession for auditors that's separate to that that of, of accountants. So there's a number of different recommendations being being made, um, and that's something that um, audit committees and boards need to be aware of because that will definitely impact on. Um, you, you as organisations as you select an auditor as you move forward uh, and certainly as, as when you're going through a tender process um, and, you're question, and, and even if we, you know, you're talking to your auditors generally you need to be aware of these changes um, because they will impact on your organisation and um, because these changes are wider than just have impact on auditors they also talk about additional responsibilities for directors and board members of organisations um, in terms of ensuring that what they're signing up to um, in terms of their financial statements is 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 effectively correct, and there's no no issues that may come back on you with regard to that. So that's a little bit around the the, the audit market, um, and fa and the final bit I really wanted to touch upon was actually a little bit about the um, the social health barometer survey that we do. Um, this is an annual survey um, that we do do, and this was issued at the back end of of, of last year. Um, the actual survey itself. Um, I don't think came up with any real surprises, um, but what you could see there is that organisations, and this is pre-Brexit, so organisations around Brexit sh showing significant concern about the impact of of that of of Brexit on on them, um, and that comes from a wider perspective around you know impact in terms of resourcing, impact in terms of the development programmes they have, um, and potential increased costs around um, some of the materials that they 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 require. And then, in terms of um, financial surplus, um, again, interestingly, um, organisations, you know, 74% of organisations expecting um, their financial surplus to, uh, in the next financial year to be as expected or lower than expected. And, and that's not, and that's a trend actually as we talk to organisations that we're seeing um, moving forward. Um, and a lot of that comes from the additional spend that organisations are having to make um, around. Um, some you know, fire uh, remedi re remediation works post post Grenfell, um, and actually, and also additional maintenance costs as well. That's certainly something that we are seeing as we move forward. And then there's a bit around um, risk appetite and prioritising of, of, of risks, um, and unsurprisingly, um, post Grenfell, uh, organisations seen health and safety as the as one of the top five risk areas of, of greatest concern. Um, and that trend, I think, will only continue as, as we move forward. So that, uh, and finally, sorry, the, in terms of management and board issues, um, an interesting trend around here, um, that organisations seen driving efficiency and innovation within organisations um, as a, one of the key driver as they, as they move forward. And that actually uh, exceeded the health and safety exposure risk um, as well. And, and you'll see scaling up development there as well, which touches upon what we talked about before. That brings us to the end of the webinar today. We will be doing these webinars on a quarterly basis in future. Our next webinar will have a focus on, on tax. If you have any questions following on from the webinar that was presented today, please contact me directly or Helen Knowles. Thank you. Mm -hmm.